You're listening to LCC Alumni Stories, a show dedicated to highlighting the amazing alumni of Lansing Community College. I'm Steve Robinson, president of LCC, and on each episode, I have the privilege of getting to know one of our many inspiring alums and hearing about their experiences at and since leaving LCC. The LCC alumni community is expansive and far-reaching. They're an incredibly diverse group of people representative of all walks of life, working in hundreds of industries across the country. LCC Alumni Stories shines a bright light on our alumni who make positive contributions to the community and showcases those who've overcome obstacles and barriers to achieve academic and personal success. These are their dynamic stories. I'm very excited today because my guest is Andy Gilman. Andy was part of our Japan Adventure Program in 1986, and he believes that this program helped set the stage for a career involving Japan. He's currently a bicultural consultant for Toyota, in addition to being the president of Hinoki Foundation, a volunteer organization that promotes Japanese-English bilingualism and multiculturalism. Andy, welcome to the show. Hello. Hey, I'm glad to be here. It's wonderful. Now, first, I have, did I pronounce the name of the foundation correctly? You know, I was very impressed. I was listening for that, and you got everything right on. It was oh, perfect. Okay, well, I I'm, I guess I'm a good guesser, but uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited, and I'd love to hear more uh, about the Hinoki Foundation. But um, you mentioned that Japan Adventure launched a career that involves your Japanese language. Tell me a little bit about what you do professionally and how you use Japanese in your work. So I call myself a, a bicultural consultant, as you said in your lead-in. Mm -hmm. And what that means is, is I help companies that work in two different cultures kind of navigate through some of the issues that they might have. That might be things like a language, like translation or interpretation. Mm -hmm. but, but also sometimes like in messaging and things like that, you, know, you want to kind of help them to, you know, make a message that's going to be appealing to the local population or that's going to land in the right way so they don't have, they don't make big errors and trip up or make, you know, mistakes that could, uh, you know, set them back uh, in their messaging. So that's yeah. fascinating to me. It sounds like, mm -hmm. if I'm hearing you right, it's more than just translating, right? Like taking one message in one language and translating it to another. When you say bicultural, you're talking about something bigger than language, something, uh, cultural differences between uh, uh, folks who are, who are coming together, probably mostly for business, right? Yeah, that's right. So it's mostly business. And in my case, it's Japanese and English. And so I might sit in a meeting, and in addition to helping with the language, people have different ways of negotiating. They have different expectations, and I'll try to lead the people to some kind of successful outcome by using my cultural knowledge that I acquired from my experience with Japan. So, and that's something you're doing mm -hmm. primarily with Toyota right now, right? Because uh, we, we're here in Michigan, we're so focused on the on the auto industry. The, a lot of bicultural work happening in the auto industry. Can you give me an example of, or two about how, um, you know, Toyota of America and, and, and some of the work that happens in Japan needs that kind of cultural guidance? Well, you know, yes, Toyota is my, is my main client. That's where I do most of my work. Mm -hmm. like for example, like if you're in a meeting with a Japanese person, they might say, if they say yes, that really means they're just going to think about it. You know, you have to, uh, that they're not totally on board, but Americans might take that back and say, we have 100% concurrence, things, so things like that. So uh, when you have, it's, it's mostly internal Toyota to Toyota things, but uh, you still have misunderstandings that can cost like a lot of time and money down the road if they're not caught early. And so my my role in some cases is to kind of prevent those from happening in the first place. That's fascinating to me because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people would assume that if you're within one corporation, like one big corporation like Toyota, that everybody would always be on the same page. What I'm hearing you say is that uh, someone could say something that literally translates as one thing, but the two different cultures would understand it differently. Yeah, that's exactly right. And Toyota is a global company, so mm -hmm. they probably have the equivalent of me in other countries as well. But, you know, some examples, and this is not specific to Toyota, but a Japanese company might try to have an advertising campaign with, uh, I don't know, a sports car that's so close to the ground that you can snuff a cigarette out on the ground. Well, that's not going to sell in America. Or, you know, an engineer might say, you know, make the interface so easy that even your wife can use it. You know, you can't say things like that in America, right? It just would not be culturally appropriate but some places might try to say that. So those sorts of things I would make sure don't get passed uh, along in the process. Wow. So those are two great examples. One would be like an idiom, right? Uh, you know, the, I, and I do know this. I'm, I, I've studied a couple of languages. I'm not fluent in, mm -hmm. in anything other than English. But I do know that 
that idioms vary from language to language. So um, uh, th obviously there are different idioms in, in Japanese and English, but also different uh, cultural mores and understandings. That's, that's fascinating. So in addition to doing this translating work, you would be uh, telling either the team on the Japanese side or the team on the, on the English-speaking side, you might need to think about this or, um, or change your messaging. That's right. And in Japanese, they have kind of a roundabout way of getting to a point, you know. And so after a meeting, I might go back to the American and say, he didn't actually, didn't actually say these words, but probably what they're trying to get is this. But they're just not going to say it that way because it would be impolite in their culture. Ah, fascinating. So yeah. that, that and that is something I've heard about. Uh, uh, so uh, really interesting. Now, does your does your work involve travel to Japan? In my case, no, uh, not for Toyota. There used to be pretty extensive domestic travel. Uh, there used, I used to accompany executives and things that would come from Japan to the United States. But the current batch, uh, they've all gone into U.S. colleges or they have pretty good English skills. So that client base has kind of uh, aged out. But earlier in Toyota's development, it's been here in the United States for something like 40 years, I think, 50 years. Right. And Our R&D has been for 40 years. And so uh, most of my work is now local. And of course, with the, with Corona and all that, a lot of it's actually online and I can do it from home. Interesting. So that's something I wouldn't have thought about. So you've been working with, uh, with Japanese uh, uh, business people uh, here in the States and with Toyota for how many years? Because I, I, I'm interested in this change. When did you start this work? Uh, I would have to kind of go back backwards, but it's something around maybe 35 years or right. so. Right. So if I yeah. heard you right, at the beginning of that, you many of the <clears throat> executives you were working with probably received all their training and higher education in Japan, but because some of the newer executives have trained here, that that's impacted the way you do your job. Yeah. The younger generation in general, it's more multicultural, which is a good thing, and mm -hmm. more tuned into the rest of the world. And that includes not just the U.S., but you have people in Japan. They know more English. Uh, we're more in touch. We have the Internet. And so some of that need is a little bit less. Now, there's still very detailed conversations or like uh, specific negotiations that might require uh, somebody who's bilingual and kind of culturally informed. But, yeah, a lot of it is not as necessary because the upper level people can already speak English or make their point pretty well. So that, that was you, not the case. Yeah, you've, you've seen yeah. that happen on the on the mm -hmm. Japanese side, where the executives from the Japanese uh, background have more uh, English language skills and more of an understanding of of uh, maybe American culture. Have you seen that change on the um, on the American side? Have American executives become more uh, culturally enlightened about how things happen in Japan? Yeah, uh, so, sometimes, and in my case at Toyota, there are a few chief engineers. That's the person who's in charge of an entire vehicle, for example, a Sienna mm -hmm. or a, a Camry. A couple of those people actually can speak Japanese and have spent time in Japan. So you see a little bit of that. Uh, but of course, we're kind of the default culture and the default language now. So there's not as strong of a need. A lot of times you'll still see high level people, even executive people at Toyota, who are not Japanese heritage, uh, but they have people to help them out with the language issues. Yeah. So, you know, I have yeah. a funny anecdote just from last week. So we do a lot of economic development work here at LCC, and I was meeting with some folks. Um, and could you do me a favor? To, ask me if I speak Japanese, like right now. <laughs> That's exactly. Okay. So uh, the gentleman in this building, he in this meeting, he looked at all of us on the American side, and, and, and he he said exactly what you said now and I had to embarrassingly say no I do not I know I know what you just asked <laughs> but yep. I do not uh, and so uh, and and he was an American businessman from another state so he was checking to see how many of us might speak Japanese it's you know it's a difference in perspective it's a difference in position but it's also a little bit more more difficult for an American uh, to go to Japan and try to learn Japanese because they have a leg up already. So the conversation tends to migrate to the stronger language. Ah, I see. Uh, and that kind of takes away the chance to practice, uh, you know, when there's not much of a need to hear somebody who doesn't speak Japanese. So, well, well, let's just get the point quicker. I'll just say it in English. So Interesting. That's, uh, well, that's probably yeah. a great pivot point to talking about Japan adventure, because for Americans who are going to learn uh, a language like Japanese, total immersion living in a country is probably one of the best ways. And that's what you... 
uh, did when you were uh, part of our Japan Adventure program. You did that in 1986. Tell me a little bit about how you learned about Japan Adventure and what your experience was like on it. Well, I had already started taking Japanese uh, at the University of Michigan as my foreign language requirement at, at LSNA, the College of Literature, Science, and mm -hmm, the Arts. Mm -hmm. And I think my dad sent me some kind of a newspaper clip. Remember newspapers? You could clip them I, out. I do remember them, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so uh, he said, hey, this sounds interesting. LCC is doing this thing, and he kind of tuned me into it. And, you know, for me, it was like the only chance I'd ever get to Japan. I had never been on a plane. Uh, I, I don't, don't know that I'd been out of the country at that point. Um, and I had four brothers, and so we had a lot. Four brothers and five uh, five brothers in six years were born in our family. So wow. a lot of competing uh, needs for the resources, and so my parents could not afford to send me to Japan. But it was only possible through the Japan Adventure for us. So, and you did it in 1986, which is early on. I think we launched the program in '82 or '83. Um, and, and I had a long, extensive conversation with uh, with Dr. Gannon uh, about that launch but so you were pretty early on so tell us you did you did you did you work on the michigan did you how long were you there yeah i was on the michigan and later later years they had other programs in different locations but i was on the michigan boat the paddle wheeler that looks like an old mississippi steam boat something like this it's exactly what it looks like uh, yeah yeah it's it's still there they think mm -hmm. they've added a floor i've been on it with my daughters now a couple times oh great yeah and uh, and so, yeah, it was it, LCC classes were every other day and mm -hmm. every other day you would go uh, be a waiter or a greeter and basically kind of, you know, mix it up with the Japanese people who were interested to learn about Americans and, and American culture. Yeah. So this uh, our, our listeners might not be familiar. So the Michigan, again, as Andy said, was a, a big uh, like river boat, like paddle boat, but it, it was, uh, it is on a, a Japanese lake, Lake Biwa, right? Tell us about that region of Japan and about Lake Biwa. Well, Lake Biwa, well, first of all, it's in the Shiga Prefecture. Shiga Prefecture is the sister state, really the sister prefecture of the state of Michigan and okay. has been for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of, uh, you know, sister cities there, uh, you know, Lansing included. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's the biggest freshwater lake in Japan. I think it would still take over a hundred Lake Biwas to make up a Lake Michigan, but in Japan, it's it's pretty big. It's a pretty big deal, uh, and they don't have any ocean frontage in this area. So, the Michigan boat would travel around the southern part of this lake on tours, just as kind of a sightseeing thing for the for the people. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a dinner cruise sort of situation. That's right. Sometimes the dinner crews, they do it in the evening, and sometimes it was just kind of sightseeing. They had different, you know, patterns, one hour or two hours or uh, evening cruises. So. And so where did uh, you but, live yeah. when, when you were there? Well, again, so we were a little bit early on, so we didn't have the luxury of well, apartments that were right next to the boat. We lived in a place far away in the apartment complex. We'd have to wake up, get on a bus, transfer to a train station, take the train station to a different train station, and then walk to the boat. You know, not the worst challenge for anybody, but, you know, a little bit more work than they had to in later years. Yeah, and how, how long were you there? The, the program, uh, you know, LCC had some initial orientation training. I think it was two or three months to start, and then it ran through November. I think the whole program was about uh, nine or ten months uh, altogether. Wow. So tell me a little bit about how your Japanese language skills evolved over that's almost a year that you were there. So did you you must have noticed a huge difference in your ability to speak Japanese? Oh, sure. You know, I had a little bit of a leg up because I'd already started studying Japanese before for like about a year uh, com compared to some of the students. But every day on the on the bus or train, I would carry my dictionary with me and look up at the signs the advertisements. And if there was a word I didn't understand, I would look it up and slowly learned how to read. Uh, what they call kanji. Those are the Japanese characters. Okay, kanji. Uh, is, that's the 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 alpha Japanese characters. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of one of the three alphabets. It's the one. There's thousands of them, and you have to be able to read at least a couple thousand to reasonably read a newspaper uh, in Japan. So that was my introduction to reading. And of course, on a day to day basis, you could interact with your coworkers. You have Japanese coworkers who mm -hmm. are the same age. We'd hang out with them. We'd travel with them. Do things with them. Uh, you know, made a lot of lifetime friends and, you know, pick up Japanese that way. So it was, it's a great introduction to Japan. Great. So, so when you came back, you, you had these, uh, in addition to your formal classroom Japanese uh, studies, you had almost a year of uh, very authentic in Japan uh, language experience. 
When did you start putting that to use professionally? Well, in the case of L LCC, I took a year off to participate in the program, mm -hmm. and then I went back to the University of Michigan where I finished my studies. And at that point, because I'd been in Japan uh, due to, to the Japan adventure, I decided to try to put it some use. And so when I went job hunting, uh, the job that I landed on was uh, a company in Japan that made rubber components or something like this. I didn't care any way to get me back there to yeah. use it. And so that's where I was able to even get more practice. So that job took mm -hmm. you back to Japan? That's right. Yeah, yep. yeah. I worked at a factory. Uh, really? And then the idea was they have you go through all the stations. This is the very Jap at the time, very Japanese way. All new employees would work for a month in each different aspect of the company from sales to manufacturer. And eventually I would come back and work as a salesman in a branch that they are, they had opened here in the United States. So again, this is my introduction, kind of this bicultural business environment mm -hmm. uh, to use to use both those skills. They wanted American faces, American salesmen who, again, knew about Japan to help move into the U.S. market. Interesting. And so, you know, because of something else I've done in my career, you must have seen that was the, 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 the last 35, 40 years. We've seen a lot of um, Japanese management and Japanese production techniques be embraced by American companies. You must have seen some of the Kaizen and other kinds of uh, techniques that are that are used in Japanese companies be embraced here in the States. Yeah, in fact, so much of it now, it seems so cliche, it's almost not worth mentioning, but it was new at the time, like Kaizen, which means to gradually improve, to constantly make things better. And then, uh, you know, just in time, not carrying more inventory than you require mm -hmm. as efficiency. Inventory requires space, that costs money, you know, the inventory itself costs money. And those things have all been pretty much taken up by any you know, major corporation in the United States at this point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What we call total quality management or yep. uh, continuous quality improvement. In fact, it's um, it's been a while since I've seen any of it, but Toyota has a whole curriculum where they teach other companies how to use these uh, techniques. Yeah. You know, they, it's, a, it's like some kind of supplier training center mm -hmm. that they open up to the general public. Because, you know, when you're working in the United States, it's it's also beneficial to Toyota that the general level of the supplier skills is higher. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so some people think, why would you do that kind of anti-competitive thing? It's like it's not it, it actually benefits, you know, it benefits the local community, of course, but it also benefits all the manufacturers. So technology mm -hmm. like the technology we're using to have a remote interview has to have changed your business as well. Right. So in addition to making it easier to talk to folks across continents, it probably has changed what you do. How has uh, web conferencing and, uh, impacted what you do as a bicultural advisor? Well, it can be a challenge if you try to interpret over some kind of online system. It's a, better, it's a bit better now, but you can have sound quality issues and you're not always able to read a room as well. Uh, you're not able to see people's mouths move. And so you have to have a pretty high level Honestly, I don't know how a younger interpreter who didn't have as much experience would get into the business now because there are certain things that are just difficult to do unless you're face to face. That's and, fascinating and also, to me. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. no, no. I'm, I'm just reacting. Yeah. And that's fascinating. Yeah. And I would love yeah. to ask you for some examples. I mean, I think I know what you're talking about, but give me some examples of communication that would be lost uh, if, if you weren't face to face. Well, there are two different things. One is just the purely technical matters of... Uh, being able to hear and having good input and having good output. Even as we're speaking now, I'm working at my home office, but there are people cutting trees in the background, right? So you can't predict <laughs> when those things are going to happen. Right, right. But some of the things I would do, and this is especially important, when you have like these relationship building things where you have like a Toyota executive might fly in and they might go talk to a major chemical company supplier or a petroleum product supplier, uh, and they will have meetings where Half of the meeting is to discuss business, but half of the meeting is to establish trust and to establish rapport. And my job sometimes is just to make the jokes keep flowing, uh, to make sure that people are having fun at a dinner uh, while drinking wine or something so that they can be comfortable with each other when they feel like they have to pick up a phone and say, hey, listen, I need to talk about that issue. So, you know, it's kind of like a social, you know, a social facilitator. That's some of the stuff that I've done in the past a lot with Toyota. And you can't do that uh, in a WebEx or a Zoom meeting. 
Well, I think we see that a lot of that across our entire society, but it's probably very stark in contrast with with. There's a reason you call yourself a a, a bicultural consultant rather than just a language interpreter, right? You're you're interpreting cultures, which includes uh, body language, nonverbals, uh, and that, and yep. uh, and social interactions. That's right. So my my job is not to repeat the words that somebody said. My job is to lead the discussion to a positive outcome for all people. And to do that, you have to understand both the cultures involved. So I I didn't plan on asking this question, but you gave a fascinating <laughs> uh, anecdote that I just have to follow up on. So if there's an interaction where in one culture, yes doesn't mean absolutely yes, we're done, we can move on. Is that something you would translate uh, and share in real time, or would you wait until afterwards? And and I'm sure it uh, it varies from situation to situation. But would you do some of that extra interpreting, or yeah. uh, uh, I guess you would provide you'd call it providing cultural context. Would you do that as yeah, it's happening there, or there, after? There are philosophical differences. If you talk to some interpreters, they'll say, your only job is to repeat what somebody said. I don't believe that. So when I was younger, if I'm a 25-year-old, I can't get away with it. But now at this stage, if somebody says something where it's not perfectly clear, sometimes I will rephrase it in a way that is perfectly clear even to the Americans. And that is not interpreting what anybody said. That's my way of making sure that communication is happening. Uh, you have to have a certain degree of confidence with that because right. you're kind of putting yourself on the line and you're interjecting yourself in the conversation. Some interpreters will not do that. They don't want to be involved in that. But my job, again, is, as I see it, is to make sure there's a good outcome. And part of that is to make sure that the intent is clear, even if the intent was not explicitly uh, explicitly spoken. You know, I find that really interesting uh, for because I, I taught writing for many, many years. My background is literacy studies. What we're in one uh, aspect, what we're talking about is the difference between uh, denotation and connotation. Right. Yes, might literally mean yes. But in this context, there might be a different connotation. So would you potentially say Ms. So-and-so said yes, but please know that in this culture that might not mean that it, this is a done deal? Or how would you how would you do that in real time? I, I would I would phrase it in a way that caught the connotation. I had a pretty funny – one time I was actually doing some court interpretation. For oh, not terrible, interesting. Just, and the, the woman was asked – she's a Japanese woman, and she was asked by the judge, uh, you know – uh, you have not received money to testify or something like this. You have not been coerced or received money to testify in the way that you're about to, so on and so forth. And in Japanese, you agree with the statement. You say, yes, I did not. So she said, yes. And so in front of a courtroom full of people, I had to explain to the judge that in this case, her yes really means no. And then turn to her and say, you will not speak any more English whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I can't because, think of... Because, it, 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 you know, if they don't trust the interpreter of the courtroom, it's a problem. Well, in Japanese, the yes really meant no in that case. Yes, I did not receive money is what she wanted to say. In English, we'd say, no, I did not. I can't think of a better <laughs> way to explain the difference between an interpreter and a bicultural consultant, because that's, yep. that's, really, uh, that's really key. Well, Andy, it has been wonderful to get to know you and hear about your story. And um, I, and I know from being in a in a social context with you, you and I met uh, in person at an event at the Japan America Society down in Detroit. You do a great job of interfacing with lots of different cultures. And I know that you share your story that a lot of this started at LCC. So from everybody at LCC, I just want to thank you for always um, promoting us and and, and giving us credit for this great experience you've had. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I think community colleges like LCC are a key element of our overall educational infrastructure. Uh, we need, need it at all layers, all levels of education, and it's given me a great start. Uh, President Gannon, you know, way back when, when I was a 18, 19 year old kid, said, you know, seize the day, your life is going to pass faster than you think. I still remember those words, and I've lived by them ever since he was uh, nice enough to share it with us. What a wonderful way to end this great conversation. Andy, I've enjoyed this so much. Uh, thanks for all you do, and I've really enjoyed getting to know more about uh, you and, and what you do with your, with your great language and cultural knowledge about Japan. Okay, great. Great, Dr. Robson. Thank you much. 
Alumni Stories is recorded and produced by Steve Robinson on LCC's downtown campus. The soundtrack, Who Told You, is licensed through DeWolf Music and was performed by Ian McCanty. Thanks for listening. Learn more about what our alumni have been up to at lccconnect.org. And if you're an LCC alum and want to share your story with me, send me an email at steve underscore robinson at lcc.edu. Until next time, keep learning. This is LCC Connect on WLNZ 89.7 FM.